of heaven. Amen? We have it all in Jesus. Praise God for that. Wonderful truths. This morning in the songs that we sung, and I trust that your heart was encouraged to worship the Lord. Romans chapter 1 in your Bibles this morning, Romans 1. And uh, did you do want to... Uh, Thank you. Children can be dismissed to junior church. And I do want to um, welcome Elizabeth and her brother uh, Caleb uh, to our service this morning. Welcome. Good to have you with us. And um, she's wearing some new hardware. Do you have it? Did it get sized? Okay, she has it. All the ladies are going to want to see it. Congratulations to Justin and to Elizabeth on their engagement yesterday. And uh, see them smiling. It's not because the sun is shining, although I'm sure they're happy about that. But uh, they are newly engaged, so we're excited uh, for you both. Thank the Lord for what he's doing in your lives and look forward to, uh, to that uh, uh, time when you get hitched. Amen? <laughs> All right. Well, let's get started here in Romans chapter 1, Romans 1 this morning. As we continue in our series, you say, Pastor, when is this going to end? Uh, soon. Soon. All right? Just as the Lord leads here. We um, are dealing with this necessity that you and I, who are God's children, have to be wholehearted towards the things of the Lord. And we've discussed many different topics throughout the scripture. This morning, I'd like you to consider the idea of evangelism, wholehearted evangelism. And if we had to sum up the life of the Apostle Paul in one title, perhaps the best title to give the Apostle Paul would be Preacher of the Gospel. Because proclaiming Christ was what consumed his heart and life. Preaching Christ, preaching the good news of the Gospel was Paul's heartbeat. He said in 1 Corinthians chapter 9 and verse 16, For though I preach the Gospel, I have nothing to glory of. For necessity is laid upon me, yea, woe is unto me if I preach not the gospel. In the life of Paul, we find lived out the topic of this morning's sermon, wholehearted evangelism. The word evangelism is a transliteration of the Greek word that we find translated here in verse 15, preach the gospel. So to evangelize means to preach the gospel. Evangelism is the preaching of the gospel. It means to bring good tidings. It's that word that was used by the angel when he told her to fear not, right? I bring good tidings. Preach the gospel. Bring good tidings. Bringing the good news to lost souls is a command that has been given to every believer. So the message of God's word this morning is not only to those who may have been formally, formally trained in the Bible. It's not just to those who are well spoken. It's not, to those, not just to those who are outgoing in personality. And it's not just to those who have been saved for a significant length of time. The biblical imperative to evangelize is to every person who has already received and believed the good news. And so with that in mind, I encourage every believer gathered here today to receive the word of God on this topic with obedience and faith. We'll discover this morning five truths regarding wholehearted evangelism from Paul's personal testimony here in Romans 1. Let's look at verses 14 through 18, and then we'll pause for prayer. I am debtor both to the Greeks and to the barbarians, 
both to the wise and to the unwise. So as much as in me is, I am ready to preach the gospel to you that, that are at Rome also. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For therein, in the gospel, is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, the just shall live by faith. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. Our fathers, we come to your word this morning. We ask that you would unfold the truths of your word in this passage to our hearts and minds. I pray, dear God, that you would give us a glimpse of the work that you want to do through us with the gospel. I pray, dear God, that you would just peel away all of the excuses and reasons, Lord, that we think or we feel we can't share the gospel. And Lord, I pray that you would put within our hearts, dear God, a humility to receive the command to proclaim the gospel to every creature and put within our hearts, Lord, a desire and a burden and, Lord, a boldness to follow that command. We thank you, dear God, for the work that you'll do in our hearts, and I pray that as a result, Lord, many lives will be touched with the gospel, brought to a saving knowledge of Jesus. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. Again, I'd like to share with you this morning five truths regarding wholehearted evangelism from Paul's personal testimony. This is him speaking about himself, not in a proud and arrogant way, but a very humble and straightforward way. Paul said that he had nothing to glory in, right, but the Lord Jesus Christ. And so we see here, number one, this morning, we see that wholehearted evangelism has a debtor mindset. Has a debtor mindset. Each of these truths this morning will speak to us, as Paul is speaking to us, about his mindset in regard to sharing the good news of the gospel. And so, number one, wholehearted evangelism has a debtor mindset. Because he says in verse 14, I am debtor, both to the Greeks and to the barbarians, both to the wise and to the unwise. Implicit in Paul's words here is this truth, number one. And that is that the gospel had made him a debtor. The gospel had made him a debtor. Paul was a debtor to the gospel. The reality of the work of the gospel in Paul's life compelled him to bring that good news to all who needed to hear. Turn over, if you would, to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. I'd like to, I'd like to just expand on... His testimony of here, uh, his testimony here of his mindset as a debtor to give the gospel. First Timothy 1, verse 12, he says, I thank Christ Jesus our Lord, who hath enabled me, for that he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry, who, talking about himself, was before a blasphemer and a persecutor and injurious, but I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord was exceeding abundant with faith and love, which is in Christ Jesus. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. Howbeit for this cause I obtained mercy, that in me first Jesus Christ might show forth all longsuffering for a pattern to them which should hereafter believe on him 
to life everlasting. Paul's testimony. His testimony was that he, having been transformed by the merciful grace and goodness of Christ, having been, been transformed by the gospel plan of God, that good news, he was now a debtor. He had been made a debtor to the gospel and by the gospel. When you consider yourself the chief of sinners and you realize the depths of sin from which Christ rescued you through the truth of the gospel, you become a debtor to it. So implicit in Paul's words here in Romans chapter 1 and verse 14 is that, number one, he's a debtor to the gospel. But explicit in Paul's words here is that he is a debtor to give the gospel to all peoples to whom God would send him, regardless of who they are. He says, I am debtor both to the Greeks and to the barbarians. The Greeks, and they were proud of the knowledge that they had. That was all important to them. Gaining knowledge. Attaining to a higher level of knowledge and understanding. And the barbarians, those were those who the Greeks described as ignorant, unlearned. He says, I'm debtor both to the Greeks and the barbarians. I'm debtor both to the wise and to the unwise. The wise. And of course, that is in man's view, right? who's wise and who's unwise. To God, it doesn't matter. Because God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten son. He gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And Paul understood that as chief of sinners, as he considered himself, having received the gospel grace of God upon his life and to his life. He was a debtor to all men. Notice with me, if you would, turn briefly to Colossians chapter 1. And I'd like you to see there verses 24 to 29. Colossians 1, 24 to 29. And he says here, Who now rejoice... In my sufferings for you, and fill up that which is behind of the afflictions of Christ in my flesh for his body's sake, which is the church, whereof I am made a minister according to the dispensation of God which is given to me for you, to fulfill the word of God, even the mystery which hath been hid from ages and from generations, but now is made manifest to his saints." To whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among you Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Whom we preach, warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom that we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus. Whereunto I also labor, striving according to his working, which worketh in me mightily. Paul preached. Warning every man God brought across his path. Teaching every man in all wisdom that he, may, uh, that he would present every man perfect in Christ Jesus. Paul was a debtor to all people. To all people groups. 1 Corinthians chapter 9 and verse 16 again. Notice that with me. If you would, 1 Corinthians 9, verse 16, Paul says there again, For though I preach the gospel, I have nothing to glory of, for necessity is laid upon me. Yea, woe is unto me if I preach not the gospel. Verse 19, he says, For though I be free from all men, yet have I made myself servant unto all, that I might gain the more. And unto the Jews I became as a Jew, that I might gain the Jews. And to them that are, that, that are under the law, as under the law, that I might gain them that are under the law. To them that are without law, as without law, being not without law to God, but under the law to Christ, that I might gain them that are without the law. To the weak became I as weak, that I might gain the weak. I am made all things to all men, that I might by all means save some. And this I do for the gospel's sake, that I might be partaker 
thereof with you. See, Paul's passion in preaching the gospel was to come alongside every person and every people group that, that God brought across his path and come to know them in, in, in a personal way and relate to them and understand them so that he might have the means, the opportunity to preach Christ to them. He saw no limitation to where the gospel ought to go. He took literally the great commission of Christ to his disciples to go into all the world to preach the gospel, to teach all nations, baptizing them and making disciples of them. Do you, realize, do you realize this morning there are 3,945 languages out of 7,360 languages in the world today that have no portion of the Word of God? That represents 255 million people. There are 4,588 unreached people groups around the world that to the best of our knowledge have no gospel witness. Nobody's sharing the gospel with them. That represents 3.23 billion people. The spreading of the precious news of Christ must be viewed as a debt owed if we are to be wholehearted in evangelism. Paul said, for we preach not ourselves, 2 Corinthians 4, 5, but we preach Christ Jesus the Lord and ourselves, your servants, for Jesus' sake. Two verses later, he says, we have this treasure in earthen vessels, clay pots. Paul is talking about himself and his fellow laborers. We're just earthen vessels. We are just cheap Clay pots. There is nothing in and of us that is of value. But we have this treasure that the excellency of the power may be of God and not us. And that's why he preached not himself, but Christ Jesus the Lord. And why he preached and proclaimed himself to be every man's servant for Jesus' sake child of God who engages in wholehearted evangelism does not see it as an option, but an inescapable responsibility. Paul unquestionably believed that he owed a debt to all men to preach the gospel. Do you? I'd like you to consider in verse 15 the second truth this morning from Paul's testimony, and that is that wholehearted evangelism has not just a debtor mindset, but a prepared mindset. In verse 15, he says, So, referring back to his debtor mindset, So, as much as in me is, as long as Christ gives me strength and health and physical ability to do so, I am ready, Paul says, to preach the gospel to you that are at Rome also. Wholehearted evangelism has a prepared mindset. That debtor mindset that we saw in verse 15, I am debtor both to the Greek and the barbarian, to the wise and the unwise, that mindset gave Paul a prepared mindset as he testifies here in verse 15. As much as in me is, I am ready to preach the gospel to you that are at Rome also. You see, in the very deepest part of Paul was a readiness to bring the good tidings to those in Rome. It's apparent that he was not content to sit still with the gospel. He possessed an urgency to declare it in all places that God would allow him to declare it. He says, I am ready. That word ready there comes from a compound Greek word, pro and thumos. It means before and passion. It has this idea of, we could say it this way, being forward in spirit. 
though he was physically absent from Rome, from the church here at Rome, his spirit was present in a passion to spread the gospel in that place. He was looking forward. He was looking to the opportunity that God might have for him to share the gospel. He had a forward-looking passion within himself. He echoes this readiness in Romans chapter 15 and verses 19 and 20. He says, Though my, through mighty signs and wonders, by the power of the Spirit of God, so that from Jerusalem and round about unto Illyricum, I have fully preached the gospel of Christ. Yea, so have I strived to preach the gospel, not where Christ was named, lest I should build upon another man's foundation. We see the same prepared or passionate mindset in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. Would you turn there with me? Uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. And I'd like you to see, uh, beginning in verse 2, 1 Thessalonians 2.2, 2, where Paul says, But even after we had suffered before and were shamefully entreated, as ye know, at Philippi, we were bold in our God to speak unto you the gospel of God with much contention. This is a result of a ready, of a prepared, of a passionate mindset when it comes to evangelism and preaching the gospel, right? They had suffered before. They were shamefully entreated at Philippi, and yet here they come to Thessalonica, and they are bold to preach the gospel of, uh, of God, even though there was much contention. Notice with me in verse 7. But we were gentle among you, even as a nurse cherisheth her children. So being affectionately desirous of you, we were willing to have imparted unto you not the gospel of God only, but also our own souls, because ye were dear unto us. For ye remember, brethren, our labor and travail, for laboring night and day, because we would not be chargeable unto any of you, we preached unto you the gospel of God. You see that mindset with which Paul entered this city and preached the gospel to these people? It was a passionately prepared and ready mindset. So deeply had the gospel impacted him personally, and so committed as a servant of Christ was he, that there was a deep and an abiding passion to proclaim it. His readiness knew the obstacles and the dangers and the afflictions in the fellowship of the gospel, yet his readiness, his passion, propelled him forward into it. Wholehearted evangelism deeply values the good news. Wholehearted evangelism understands the cost of bringing that good news to lost souls, and yet despite these two competing things. You have the good news and you have the obstacles to it. Wholehearted evangelism moves forward in passionate labor to spread the gospel of Christ. That was Paul's mindset. Nothing could stop him. Consider number three, the first part of verse 16. Wholehearted evangelism has, number one, a debtor mindset. Number two, a prepared mindset. But number three... It also has a shameless mindset. Because Paul says here at the beginning of verse 16, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. Paul tells us here that his passionate readiness to preach the gospel grew out of a heart of shamelessness about the gospel. He was ready because he was not ashamed. In other words, there was nothing holding him back. Paul was a man that once had great pride in who he was. His life had been built on all that he had accumulated to his name. He describes it in Philippians chapter 3 as confidence in the flesh. 
And he lists all of the things that his reputation was built upon. And then he says that he counted all of those things as waste in exchange for Christ. At that moment in his life, he went from hero to villain in the minds of his Jewish brethren. And the sufferings and afflictions of his ministry bear that out. He was ashamed to them. But that didn't deter him from glorying in the gospel that had transformed his life. And he maintained throughout his ministry an unashamed heart attitude toward the gospel. It was all for Christ, as is reflected in Philippians chapter 1 and verse 20, where he writes, According to my earnest expectation and my hope that in nothing I shall be ashamed, but that with all boldness, as always, so now also Christ shall be magnified in my body, whether it be by life or by death. Paul had a shameless mindset toward the gospel. Folks, the gospel of Christ is pure. It's fully sufficient. And it's full of glory. If you've been saved by it, then you know that. You've experienced that personally. The problem believers run into is that the world despises the gospel. It hates the good news of Jesus Christ. And in man's self-righteousness, his depraved heart rejects the need and the purpose of the gospel. He speaks shame upon it and upon those who believe it. And too often that has a chilling effect upon us who believe it. And therefore we fail to wholeheartedly proclaim it and live it. Paul gave Timothy great encouragement against this in 2 Timothy chapter 1. Would you turn there briefly with me? 2 Timothy chapter 1. Paul was encouraging Timothy to be strong and to be faithful and not, not shrink back in fear as he preached the gospel. And he says in first, or excuse me, 2 Timothy 1.8, he says, Be not thou therefore ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me his prisoner, but be thou partaker of the afflictions of the gospel according to the power of God. Embrace the pain, Paul says. He goes on to say in verse 9, God, who hath saved us and called us with an holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given us in Christ Jesus before the world began, but is now made manifest by the appearing of our Savior Jesus Christ, who hath abolished death and hath brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. That was Paul's message. Verse 11, whereunto I am appointed a preacher and an apostle, and a teacher of the Gentiles, for the which cause, for the gospel's sake, he says, I also suffer these things. Nevertheless, I am not ashamed. I'll gladly take all the criticism, all the vitriol, all the physical abuse that I have to take in order to preach the gospel message that God has appointed me to preach. I'm not ashamed. He says, nevertheless, I am not ashamed, for I know, what? Whom I have believed. And I am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. What an encouragement for Timothy to have a shameless mindset toward the gospel. Wholehearted evangelism is shameless toward the gospel. It doesn't shrink back in the face of criticism. It doesn't fear what men may say or what men may do. It embraces the good news of Jesus as the only truth that can deliver people from sin and bring them into a right relationship with God. 
And so wholehearted evangelism has a shameless mindset. Notice with me in verses, the rest, the remainder of verse 16 and then in verse 17. Number four, wholehearted evangelism has a dependent mindset. A dependent mindset. He says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. Why? For it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. And so here, immediately following Paul's statement that he is unashamed of the gospel, he gives the reason. It's twofold. Number one, he says it's the gospel that is the power that brings people to salvation. The message of truth contained in the gospel is the powerful link between sinful mankind and a holy God. It's powerful in that it provides the only possible solution to the sin problem that's found in the heart of every man, every woman, and child. The gospel is wholly sufficient, and therefore Paul relied unashamed, uh, unashamedly on it to accomplish the ministry that God had entrusted him with. It's the gospel that is the power of salvation. Paul said, we, we, we looked at this passage in Sunday school this morning, 2 Corinthians Chapter 2, I believe, where Paul says, Look, I came in fear and trembling. My speech was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but it was in demonstration of the Spirit and of power. And where was that power found? It was in the gospel of Jesus Christ. As the Holy Spirit takes that good news and works in people's hearts and convicts of sin and shows them the truth that Jesus saved. Wholehearted evangelism has a dependent mindset. It depends upon the gospel as the power of God unto salvation. But the second reason that Paul was unashamed of the gospel was also, number two, that it is the means, the gospel is the means by which God's righteousness is revealed. Continuing in verse 17, he says, not only is the power of God uh, not, not only is the gospel the power of God unto salvation, but he also says in verse 17 that in the gospel, therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, the just shall live by faith. In Philippians chapter 3, Paul says, look, I came to the point in my life, and paraphrasing here, that I realized that my righteousness was waste. It was utterly useless. And I needed the righteousness of Christ. And so clearly and so passionately did he understand that, that, that he clearly and passionately proclaimed that, look, in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed. The cure for sin is revealed. The gospel is a means by which God's righteousness is revealed. This is its power. God's righteousness had to be revealed to mankind for mankind's salvation. And Paul knew the power of God's righteousness because he testified again in verse of, uh, Philippians chapter 3, verses 8 and 9, Yea, doubtless, and I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and I do count them but dung, that I may win Christ and be found in him, not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. You see, the power of God is the gospel. The gospel is the power of God unto salvation because in it is revealed to mankind God's righteousness. The mistake that many believers make in regard to evangelism is that they depend upon themselves. Typically, this is revealed in two ways. One believer may have a high opinion of his own speaking, speaking and reasoning abilities. And he will share the gospel depending, relying upon those abilities to draw folks to Christ. Another believer... Probably most of us sitting here have a low opinion, 
of our own speaking and reasoning abilities. But the danger there is that we're still relying upon ourselves, aren't we? And therefore we neglect to share the gospel because we are depending upon ourselves. And when we look inside, we, see, oh, we say, oh man, I can't do that. I don't have it in me. Wholehearted evangelism has a dependent mindset. It relies upon the gospel of Jesus Christ to do the life-changing work that every unsaved person needs in their lives. Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 19, Paul, after he encouraged these believers to take hold of the spiritual armor of God and to put it on and to protect themselves. He says, and pray for me that, uh, that, that utterance may be given unto me that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel. By the way, I see in there, I see in Paul's words there a tendency to be tempted to fear and sharing the gospel. In fact, he admitted it. Right? 2 Corinthians 2. I came to you when I came. I came in fear and trembling. And so he asked them to pray for him. When they put on the armor and when they, uh, when they put it on with prayer, he says, pray for me that utterance may be given unto me. That I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel. Folks, listen. The power of the gospel is not found in you or anything about you. It's found in the revelation of the righteousness of God through Jesus. And the believer that's engaged in wholehearted evangelism is dependent not upon himself, but upon the gospel of Christ to change lives. Lastly, this morning, notice with me verse 18. I'd like you to see here that wholehearted evangelism has a sober mindset. It has a sober mindset because Paul says here, look, the righteousness of God is revealed in the gospel. And the just will live. They will gain eternal life by faith. But the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. In other words, they hear the truth and they turn it into a lie. They turn it into something that's evil in their own hearts and minds. Paul here had a sober mindset in regard to the gospel and those who had rejected. He referred to the revelation of the righteousness of God in the gospel and now he refers to the revelation of the wrath of God toward the unrighteousness of man. This gave him a sober mindset. The wrath of God to Paul was a sobering thought that propelled him to be wholehearted in his evangelism. Turn with me real quickly to Romans chapter 2, and I'd like you to notice uh, verse 3. Romans chapter 2 and verse 3. And thinkest thou this, O man, that judgest them which do such things and doest the same that thou shalt escape the judgment of God? Or despisest thou the riches of his goodness and forbearance and long suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance? Now get this. He says, But after thy hardness and impenitent heart treasurest up unto thyself wrath against the day of wrath in revelation of the righteous judgment of God who will render to every man according to his deeds. Paul had a sober mindset when he considered the righteous the fair and the just judgment of God upon the unrighteousness of mankind. And he was echoing the words of Jesus here in Romans chapter 1 and verse 18 when he speaks of the wrath of God being revealed from heaven against all ungodliness 
in unrighteousness, he echoes the message of Jesus because Jesus said, John 3 and verse 18, he that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. Verse 36, he said, he that believeth on the Son hath has gained everlasting life, but he that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. Jesus also said, Matthew chapter 3, verses 7 and 8, he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees come to his baptism, and he said unto them, O generation of vipers, who hath warned you to flee from the wrath to come, bring forth therefore fruits, meet for repentance. And then he said in Matthew chapter 10, verse 28, and Fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul, but rather fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. The reality of eternal punishment against the unbeliever must find deep root in the heart of every believer. This creates urgency around the gospel. It creates seriousness around the gospel. And it creates within us a wholehearted evangelism that sees souls on the path to destruction. Your neighbor, your co-worker, your friend, your family member that dies without Christ is headed to an eternity of judgment. And how sobering that reality must be to your heart. When we're half-hearted in our approach to sharing the gospel, it is at least in part because we fail to see the fires of hell threatening lost souls. Paul said in 2 Corinthians, or excuse me, 2 Thessalonians chapter 1 and verse 7. I'll read it for you. 2 Thessalonians 1, 7 through 9. He said, And to you who are troubled, rest with us. When the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. Paul had in his heart and mind a soberness in regard to the wrath of God against sin. In conclusion this morning, I'd like to read to you the testimony that Paul gave to the Ephesian elders. We find it in Acts chapter 20, verses 26 and 27. He says, Wherefore, I take you to record this day. Mark it down, he says that I am pure from the blood of all men. For I have not shunned to declare unto you all the counsel of God. He was able to make this claim because he was wholehearted toward the proclamation of the gospel. He was wholehearted because he saw himself as a debtor. He was wholehearted because he was passionately prepared to preach the gospel wherever the Holy, the Holy Spirit took him. He was wholehearted in his evangelism because he was unashamed of the message that he was preaching. He was wholehearted because he was dependent upon the gospel to be sufficient to do the work, to reach men's hearts. And he was wholehearted in his evangelism because he was sober about the reality of eternal damnation. So I ask you this morning, what is your attitude towards sharing the gospel? Is it, I'll share it if somebody asks, or I'm not a gifted speaker, or I could never be like Paul, or I'm afraid what they might say, or I'm afraid I won't know what to say. There's a significant difference between that mindset, that attitude, and Paul's attitude of, I owe a debt to all men. 
I am unashamed of the good news. I fully rely upon the power of the gospel. I am passionately ready to proclaim the gospel. And I fear the eternal punishment of hell for my fellow man. So I ask you this morning, will you begin this morning to pray regularly for the wholehearted approach of Paul that we find here in Romans chapter 1 to become your approach, your heart attitude, your desire, your passion, your lifestyle, your ministry. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, I just ask you this morning that your spirit would move within us in such a way that we say, Lord, I surrender all. All to Jesus, I surrender. Father, I pray that you would, that you would break down the barriers, that you would remove the hindrances, that you would excuse the excuses from our lives that keep us from sharing the gospel. And Lord, I pray that where we have been hesitant, where we've been apathetic, where we have been resistant to share Christ to those who need to know him, I pray that, Lord, your, your forgiveness would cleanse us and that your grace would make us bold, Lord, to do what you've called us to do. We thank you, dear God, for the Apostle Paul and his testimony, and I pray, Lord, that we would see ourselves in his shoes, Lord, the chief of sinners, rescued by the good news of Jesus Christ and his merciful and gracious and loving work upon the cross. Lord, you have redeemed us. You've saved us. You've plucked us out of the pit. You've delivered us from damnation and destruction. Father, how can we not share that glorious message to all those who have yet to be saved. We ask for your will and your way this morning in our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. With your heart.